Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite to the stage four members of our 1981-82 Premiership teams. Jim Buckley, Phil Malin, Captain Mike Fitzpatrick and Coach David Parkin, along with Ken Sheldon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, five greats of the Carlton Football Club. <laughs> Parko, I'm going to start with you. Just have a look, just have a look on my left and right. It'd be enough to put anybody off the rest of their life, wouldn't it? <laughs> Now, Parco, Carlton had won the flag 12 months earlier in 1979 when you first arrived at the end of 1980. Having said that, nine members of that 1979 Premiership team wouldn't be in the Premiership team in 81. There was a fair bit of change, three coaches in three years. What were your expectations of Carlton when you rolled in at the end of 1980? Um, I thought I was the luckiest bloke in the world, really, to be given the uh, opportunity. I'd just been sacked by the uh, brown and gold mob over the road. And uh, was feeling fairly, uh, fairly ordinary as a person, I think, as a professional in the in the uh, football arena, and to have the opportunity then offered to me to come and coach Carlton was a, a bolt out of the blue, and literally bolt out of the blue. And nice. uh, it was uh, a unique experience. The two clubs culturally are so different in the manner which they go about all things, probably still today as well. So to be absorbed into that club amongst those players who had enormous success in the previous two years was just a fantastic opportunity. Kenny, David just mentioned the culture of the club. Tell us a little bit about what the culture of Carlton was at that time in the late 70s, early 80s. And tell the truth. <laughs> well, you, you'd just given Kevin Heath the arse at Hawthorne and then you arrived at Carlton and given the arse again. <laughs> well, he had to be stiff, didn't he? How stiff's that? He just gave him the ass for drinking too much. He, he turns up at Carlton, he's free range drinking, and Parco turns up. <laughs> what happened? Did he ever get a good game? <laughs> but the, the culture uh, was uh, there's a fellow called Peter Shockman that um, David brought with him, and it was all about quality and intensity. Quality and intensity. And uh, if we heard that word, those words once, we heard them 5,000 times in the next five years. Uh, but particularly in the early stages, quality and intensity was, um, was pretty paramount to, uh, to where we're at. So everything behind being able to get yourself into that position to be able to deliver on the big stage was, uh, was what the culture was about, Jason. Jimmy, was there a bit of a culture shock when Parker arrived? He was obviously a disciple of the fierce disciplinarian, John Kennedy. Yeah, well, he, uh, he tried. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll never forget the first uh, pre-season run we had up at Mount Macedon and up that dirty, rotten hill, he thought it'd knock us out. And uh, there was about 50 slabs in the corner over there. He said, what, what's that for? He said, the boys want to drink after the run. <laughs> he said, they couldn't drink that. And he said, uh, I think they can. <laughs> but and, no. and they did. <laughs> but... Um, now David brought another another level look another level to the uh, the coaching. I think it I always stayed I, and um, that David was probably the most innovative bloke in coaching from the the early eighties um, right through. And everyone followed him. Don't worry about it. Cheaty followed him and all that. They all trying to get under what what he was doing. And uh, he brought that level. And it, and that's what we needed. You know, we had a great basis of a side. You know. The older players, the younger players, players knocking on the door to get in. But he brought us to another level of training. And, you know, we, don't worry, we trained very, very hard. Probably not as hard as Jesse did in 79, until he killed us all. <laughs> but it was a more in, in, um, intensive training that we needed and a smarter, a smarter level of football. And uh, that's what brought us around. And, the, you know, he pushed us to things that we couldn't do. He didn't think we could do, but we could. And that was a... That was a um, a healing to the uh, players who David, you know, well, well knows now that uh, it can be done. Phil, you turned up from Woodville the year before, 1980, and you, your first 43 games leading up to the grand final of 81, you played in 32 wins from 43 games. What was it like to step into a team that had that amount of talent all around you on every line? I don't know, it was obviously, uh, it was a fantastic uh, time in my life because as you say, I came from Woodville and um, in Adelaide and 
Uh, our motto was we don't win many games, but we have a lot of fun. Um, so that was, uh, you know, I got a good breeding from that aspect of football. And, uh, but certainly, you know, stepping into Carlton, you know, I learned a lot of things at Carlton. Um, right from the very first day, you know, Mark McClure taught me how to bypass the uh, nightclub line and get through to the front door without paying. All the essentials. Yeah, which was obviously really important back in those days because there were big lineups to get into nightclubs. Para taught me how to shoot cans and stuff. So, you know, those things were, you know, were life lessons for me. Um, and uh, I've tried to carry them through up until now. <laughs> Well, Carlton claimed the 1981 minor premiership, 17 and 5, then glitched along in the second semi and ended up in their second grand final against Collingwood in three years. But Mike, two of Carlton's losses that year had been to Collingwood. Your biggest loss of the season, 57 points in round six and Dakes kicked seven and then one point in round 16 after being 20 points up at half time. So what was the vibe and the belief amongst the group when you knew it would be Collingwood you'd be facing on grand final day? Oh, look, I think, <coughs> I think the belief was we could win it. It was, it was really just a matter of uh, how we went on the day and um, what the preparation was like. Uh, in a cultural sense, you know, we were a really tight group and it was interesting having Bossy's comments before about selflessness and how important that was and how important it is to decide now because the only one two side was very much like that. Had a lot, basically the guys on match day would give everything for each other. Match evening, bit different. But match day, <laughs> absolutely. And then, of course, listening to Nick talking about uh, the need for secrecy, we were very secret about how, what our tactics were and everything else as players. Our problem was the coach tended to tell everybody what was going to happen <laughs> the next few days. So leading into 81 and 82, our only real concern was how much the, to the coach had actually told various people, some of whom would have been Collingwood supporters. <laughs> let's be fair, Michael. Let's be fair about this. Some people will be uh, old enough here to remember that the le week leading up to the grand final, the, the um, Mike's diaries were written in the paper. And uh, he was kind enough to give them to me on the Monday before we played the grand final the following Saturday. And I had to read the exposure of our total club game plan. Strengths and weaknesses <laughs> were delivered in the newspaper during the week leading up to the grand final. It was a magnificent effort against that backdrop to actually win. It was, it was actually... <coughs> it's a bit unfair, it was the week after. <laughs> <laughs> Slight difference. Collingwood actually jumped out of the gates. They controlled that game early. They didn't take their chances. Only led by two points at quarter time. Carlton, much better in the second term. Got, it was a really close contest. The rain swept, swept, swept in Kenny in the main break. Third quarter, totally different looking game. Carlton were dominant early but didn't take their chances. Collingwood then kicked four in 10 minutes. Suddenly it was 21 points at the 29 minute mark of the third term and the pies were up and about. They were irresistible for a period there, weren't they, Ken? Were there any doubts starting to, to creep in? Because 21 points, low scoring game, wet conditions, decent margin. Yeah, and the coach, the coach was really powerful at three-quarter time um, with his speech. He really emphasised the need to kick the first one after the, uh, after the bounce, and he thought that we had the fitness back to quality and intensity and the Peter Shockman regime um, that we could, uh, we could um, overpower them. So he, he, he was actually, I don't mind saying this, he was actually inspirational. It's one of the first only, only coaches addresses I ever remember. Well... <laughs> Funny you mention it. Um, I hope this works. We've got a DVD. In 2006, I made a documentary for Fox Footy about this period, and I'd like to share a snippet with you all. Uh, it picks up the story at three-quarter time of the 1981 grand final. The two teams heading to their respective huddles, so let's press play and see if DVD technology still works in 2022. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> slamming on two late goals in the third term to reduce the margin from 21 to 9 points at the last break of the 1981 grand final, Collingwood fans are daring to dream all over again. But in the Magpie huddle, the excruciating pressure to break this hoodoo may be starting to take its toll. Collingwood Chairman of Selectors Thorold Merritt challenging wingman Ricky Barham for fumbling in a contest that resulted in a goal to Jimmy Buckley right on three-quarter time. 
that he thought one of our players uh, didn't go hard enough in the contest in the third quarter. And um, matter of fact, it was pretty well disgraceful. Um, and I thought my life thorough on it. I think even though he made a mistake because he, he questioned that person's courage during that period and all the help broke loose really there's a lack of control I think from everybody um, we were probably trying to stop um, that lack of control going to a higher level and in doing so we didn't get a lot of direction in, in that third quarter huddle um, and it wasn't Tommy's fault it was just this thing exploded which shouldn't have exploded if anything was going to say it should have been said after the final of Siren and then it was just, uh, we just lost the play. So uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it was totally the reason why we didn't win the grand final, but that lack of organisation at that time and the crucial time was pretty important. I hear later that there were words spoken by different people, but I was not aware of that at a particular time. It might have been other people, uh, not so much the coaching staff, or I'm not quite certain, but there was different things said. Uh, about the last couple of goals that Carlton had gone, which then got the momentum up for him to win the game. But I was told, you know, not, not after the game, but a couple of days later, something like that had happened, and uh, um, not the right time, but unfortunately. And, uh, you know, for a bloke like Ricky, who's a very confident player, if, if something was said to him about that, um, it wasn't going to help him. A little more than 20 metres away from the Collingwood Huddle, Carlton coach David Parkin is sensing the magpies are about to implode. Parkin produces a detailed post-match analysis that's privately circulated within his club's inner sanctum after every match he coaches. The following is an extract from his post-match report on the 1981 Grand Final, a sensitive document that has remained confidential until now. The reason for my positive approach at three-quarter time was a result of what I saw in the last few minutes of the third quarter. Goals to Buckley and Aspen were the easiest of the day from a pressure point of view. Collingwood had given all by that stage. I knew if the first goal was kicked by us at the start of the last quarter, it would shatter their hopes. Although we didn't score heavily, we maintained a relentless pressure on them, as done earlier. Winning the ball, using the intelligence, running hard and still chasing like hell. Our running straight really exposed a number of Collingwood players. Incidents throughout the game must have been team lifting for Carlton and absolutely demoralising for them. I remember specifically Howe's run at Wall, Duel at Barham, Johnson at Allen and Hunter at Wall, who saw the ball end up with a Carlton player every time. Fitzpatrick's continual jumping at Atkin and Wall set the patterns for our plates to the wall. I cannot remember another game in 1981 when our team ran straight like your heart. It's something we must never forget. convincing three-quarter time address that they'd ever heard from me, but it was based on factual information that I observed, not only regard to what we were doing, but what Collingwood wasn't doing at that stage, and I was confident to say we just had to keep applying ourselves as we had in the latter part of the third quarter, and we would, not just could, we would win the game. While Parker is obviously unaware of any specific conversations taking place within the Collingwood huddle, his gut feeling on the state of the game proves to be right on the money. Collingwood disintegrates in the final term as the Blues finish all over the top of them in a grand final yet again. Four goals, seven to two behinds, carrying Carlton to a 20-point victory that equals Collingwood's long-standing record of 13 VFL premierships. The grief and utter disbelief in the Magpie camp is inconsolable. Evidenced by Captain Peter Moore's symbolic gesture of flinging his runners-up medal away in complete frustration. Five grand finals in five years. Nothing to show. And incredible to think that within 12 months, Collingwood's coach, captain, entire board would be gone as the club spiralled out of control. And indeed, within a few years, they were bankrupt and just one member's vote from being extinct. It just goes to show how half an hour of football can change the destiny of two football clubs. Parker, you were bang on the money at three-quarter time. Your memories of that final term dominance and indeed that overall 1981-82 group. Yeah, look, I don't think his players would know, and those in the audience who know me, I'm not the most confident person unless I think the, uh, the detail or the information or the, 
the, the input is, is obvious. And I think what the players did, I think that, what's the word, that explains how our thinking was at, over three quarter time in the last quarter. And you've still got to have the capacity and our playing group did. There was just a powerful, in that four or five years time through Percy's time and uh, Jez's time, etc. there was an unbelievable, I, I couldn't understand it until I became a part of it. It didn't matter where we were in a game and who the opposition happened to be, there was a powerful belief that had been built on performances over a long period of time. And I was not the most confident person in the world, but I had a belief deep down that these players could achieve what they wanted to because we had an enormous ability amongst that group. Over that period of time, four or five seasons in the competition, it would have been the most talented group of footballers, including the Melbourne, I was the Melbourne Barracka, including the Melbourne in the 60s, who we were pretty good, but I reckon Carlton had it covered in terms of pure football talent or ability, which include the mental side as well, uh, and they sadly weren't able because of injury. I think Perth was really sad to miss out because he couldn't have the players available that he needed to do the game. They could have, could have probably won four premierships in a row. Jimmy, you were part of that team within the team, the, the vaunted Mosquito Fleet, the likes of Ashman, Sheldon, Johnston, Harms, Mark Hu, your good self, then runners like Phil Maitland and David Glasgow on the wings. What an amazing depth of talent through the middle of the ground. Yeah, they all brought their own um, own game with them. You know, like the, they're very quick, very quick, and uh, you know, willing. There's the shark had a lot of shit in him. He wanted to, he'd, he'd give you one on the chin on the run through. Don't worry about that. You know. Ashy, very, very unassuming. Ashy, he could sneak go. Yeah, no problem about that. Um, you know, Harmsy, Bomber. They're all. Everyone had their. Uh, you know, their aspect, that's just what it was about. Everyone brought their, their game and, uh, you know, if, if anything like those guys today, we would have been like to be rucking to uh, uh, playing against today, those guys, uh, Harry Mackay and Charlie Kerner. Like, we had Sellers, he, he dropped plenty, so we got plenty of there. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, Sellers, you're a superstar, don't worry. <laughs> but those, what, the way the ball swoops down there, that we, 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 if the ball hit the ground, it was like, get out of my way, you know. We were coming through and... And it was all coordinated. And, and the good part about these guys, they were all good kicks. They could mark for their size. And, and they were speedy and they had a bit of shit in them. That's what, you know, that's what we've got to have. And uh, that, that's what's needed today. You know, just, just getting back to, to one thing there. Today they said about the... We looked about all the nightclubs, uh, all the uh, new um, uh, rooms and that down there today. There's one thing they left out of those rooms and it's a, jet, it's a, it's a Nicky's nightclub. And it's a Jezza's job or a Parco, whatever we call Parco. We didn't tell him what it was called, Parco. But that's where you make your mateship up in those rooms. And in our games that down there, and all the older guys would know that those rooms, many grand final were won in those rooms. You've got to have your mateship in that there. But you've got to get one of them uh, prayers. You've got to get the one made up there, right? There's no doubt about it, where you can get together and have a drink and tell your stories and don't get heard. And don't tell Parco. So we... So, Jimmy, if I've got the specs right, it's a room, a bar, and it's soundproof. Yes, yeah, exactly. Perfect. Exactly. 82 rolled around, the challenger back-to-back. -back. Not quite as dominant through the season as 81. Richmond returned to the premiership picture under Francis Burke. Carlton belted Hawthorne in the second half of the qualifying final. Fell to Richmond in the second semi, then beat Hawthorne again in the prelim to set up another grand final. Some selection intrigue on grand final day. Parco ran out 22 players. David Clark and Frank Marcazzani ran out with the team, then headed back up the race. Parco, what was that all about? <laughs> They've never spoken to me since. I think no. I had today it was a long conversation with Frank Marcazzani that happens to be here, and I can apologise to him publicly for putting through it. David, it's really interesting because David and I have remained ongoing and very good friends all all the way through. We've got houses down at Point Lonsdale, run into each other all the time. So. David's sort of forgiven me too, but you think about the consequences of running out and being a part of the warm-up in your gear and ready to play in a grand final and you're removed by the coach before the game starts. Um, I'm even uh, embarrassed to, uh, to talk about it, but we were able, they allowed you to do that course, you wouldn't be allowed to do that today and uh, it was part of the process of, of leaving them, Richmond, in a uh, position of not knowing wh what was coming and who we were. I think we started buzzers here, but then we might have started buzz on the bench as well. 
in an unex unexpected yeah. move. So we did a couple of things, having been walloped by them a couple of weeks before. We uh, had to go back via the preliminary final to, to get to them again. So it was stupid going in with the same setup, with the same players doing the same role and playing the same way. So we made a, a almost a somersault in the way we went about it, which I think we had three goals, maybe three goals, one before Richmond had touched the ball. Got a good memory. Yeah. Two goals in the first 70 seconds. Fitzy, the first 15 minutes, Lou Richards and Bob Skilton described in the coverage as the most brutal grand final opening in 20 years. Richmond went the man really hard. There was lots of scuffles, lots of sniping. And as Parco mentioned, you guys went the ball and got a three goal jump on them before Richmond settled down. It was, it was on early. Uh, it was hot. <laughs> no, it was, it was, the start of that game was very hot and we expected it to be and we, we were ready for it. Um, and I, I think I've said in other places, the 73 grand final where essentially they beat us up, that, that sort of, the view of Carlton's sides as being talented but not tough had lived with us, even despite 79 and everything else. But to get the Tigers in 82 and to knock them off, sort of got rid of all that, which was terrific. Um, and that was built around a team that basically did everything it could at the start to basically just get on top. And, you know, there was the usual brawl and everything else. I'm not sure it was a worse or better brawl than most grand finals. It's usually one in the first quarter just to sort of establish some sort of order of next how it's going to go. Um, but, you know, at the end of the game, we both won the game and the fight. So we're pretty comfortable with the whole thing, really. Can, can, I, add, can I add something? Because unbeknownst, unbeknownst to most people, I stopped them as they were about to run down the race. I think the players will remember this. And I said, uh, thinking about our little blokes, and at Richmond would take one of those eight or nine of our champion little players out. I said, if one of our blokes goes down, turn round and knock the bloke out standing next to you. <laughs> and if, if and when he wakes up, you ask him, I say, that's for me little mate down there. For good Carlton supporters will remember that uh, at the end of that burst, the bloke who went down, Alex, we love you forever, Alex Marku, he was knocked, knocked over by big, tough Lee. Like, seriously. Um, and our players ran from everywhere. The blue started on the half forward flank on the, uh, on the outer side. I look around to see the back six to see how coachable they were. And to my absolute delight, Mario Bortolotto turned around and King hit David Cloak with the best right cross <laughs> I've ever seen. And David went down on his ass in the goal square and I see Mario standing over him like this. And, and David said to him, what the hell that's for? He said, that's for me little mate up the ground there. <laughs> I take Mario Bortolotto out for dinner every year to thank him for that input. Phil, Richmond were incredibly talented. They had guns all over the place. They suddenly clicked in a gear. They kicked four goals in 10 minutes, hit the front by quarter time and the game was on. They were, they were a fantastic team, a seasoned team that had been there before as well. Yeah, well, obviously they were, they were top all year and, you know, I think um, I can remember sort of getting towards the end of the season, you know, we were looking like we might miss it and uh, I, I can still remember now we got beaten up in Sydney and um, I remember I got a letter and I think a few other blokes in this room got a letter from the coach um, just saying, you know, you, you've dropped the ball a bit, um, you know, things are not going as well and if we want to play in finals this year that we're going to have to, uh, you know, collectively and individually lift our games and I, I think to the coaches' merit and especially to the players who um, I've never played, you know, with a better bunch of blokes than I played with from uh, 80 to 84. They were just sensational players, I love them all. And I just knew, I don't know, I just knew, we, when it came to the crunch in a really big game, and that was, you know, and put it bluntly, our balls are on the line, um, I just knew that the hard training, you know, we used to do, we used to have match practice every Tuesday night, full on match practice, it wasn't just, you know, you run around without mouth guards, it was two hours of full on, and I knew we were fit, and I, and I knew that, you know, the way we train, I know we, we, we partied hard, but I've never trained as hard as I ever did through that period of my career. 
And I just knew that when it came to the crunch, that, you know, the quality of the people that we had in the team, you know, would lift us up and carry us to the line. Richmond got out to a three-goal lead at the 19-minute mark of the second term. And as Phil said, the game was just tilting their way. Carlton managed to get it back on terms. And by the early stages of the third term, it was an arm wrestle again. Phil kicked the opening goal of the four to five minutes in. Fitzy added another to put Carlton in front. Then a moment that will live forever in footy folklore. A young lady by the name of Helen D'Amico jumped the fence. And of all the players she could run to, happened to make a beeline straight to Bruce Dool. Turns out the entire episode was a orchestrated PR stunt paid for by an adult establishment in Adelaide. And uh, Jimmy, you were lined up on the members' wing at the time, so you got a, a fantastic landscape of the whole thing. What are your memories of, of that moment? I was worried about Wow. <laughs> he was lurking. Well, I watched the video. I watched the video, Jimmy. Wow actually runs away from her. Oh, bullshit, he did. Uh, that was a that was a poor cloy. <laughs> the dominator runs over, grabs her by the scarf, says, "Get out of here." Fitzy then runs over in her general direction. Fitzy, were you trying to just settle things down or get a closer look, or what was going on there? I, I don't think anybody needed a closer look. <laughs> um, so, in fa from our point of view, we kicked a couple, and we really didn't want the interruption. We actually had them. Just for, and in games, you know, for a while, you'll you'll get the opportunity. You take it or you don't, and and we were taking it, and this turns up, and and <laughs> so so. Domino did exactly the right thing, and if he hadn't grabbed hold of her and you know, taken her to the boundary line, a few, a few of the others of us would have, and including myself, because you don't want that interruption. <laughs> You're playing footy, just you know, focus on the game. So it was, it, it was annoying from our point of view because we just had that <laughs> ten minutes or so where we really had them on the, on the ropes. To your credit, Kenny, it didn't break the team's concentration. Carlton kicked the next three goals. Yep. Opened up a handy break. Kenny's already in tears here. Tigers fought back hard. Look, it was actually a really tight game. You look at the final score and you think, oh, Carlton won it comfortably, but it wasn't until Alex Marcoux kicked that goal at the 24-minute mark of the last quarter to seal it. <laughs> then Peter McConville into an open goal to really ram it home. So tighter than 81, not quite as tense as 79. How do you rate that 1982 grand final victory? Uh, the 82 grand final victory is probably, well, 79 was the best, 81 was the best, and I think 82 was the best. Fair enough. <laughs> and I think it was the best because it was a sustained effort. And I remember actually reading Phil's uh, letter, that letter that he got, I remember that reading that with Alex Marku with Chase's that letter. Is um, that an official team meeting? Which, yeah, an official team meeting. Yeah, of yes. You, you saying you didn't get the letter. Yeah. <laughs> well, if I did, it was like that in retrospect. Um, it often got left in the locker. If you, if you didn't have excellent, very good or good, you just threw it away because you knew you were getting the arse next week. So it was pretty tough, um, wasn't it? You were very brutal. And are you going to thank Lynette for doing all that work too? Uh-oh, you're getting the debts there. It was magnificent what you brought to us. You brought us a, a much more scientific approach to our game. Jimmy alluded it to it before. It was enormous how you toughened us and structured us up. Like, we had some fantastic times in the late 70s, culminating in a 79 premiership. Trevor Keogh, Barry Armstrong, Jeff Southby. Like, we were enormous. And then in 80, we had a chance. We let it slip because too many of us had buff heads. You come in and uh, straighten us right up with an enormous scientific approach. And you also put some com really quality communication in behind that. I'll be at Lynn typed it all for you. Um, but it was magnificent stuff, David. And uh, uh, you know, you, you coach I'm, four. You coach four right, premierships. Right, no, don't go any further. Right. I'm, I'm coming to a Chuka next weekend. And I'll buy you dinner. Right. <laughs> One you last can, one, David, to wrap, to wrap can, it up, Parker. You can come out and address the team at three quarter time. Moama versus Nathalia. Moama magpies too. Parker, you've got a wonderful and deep association with players from this era. What do they mean to you? Look, it, it's, it's interesting because I had no idea um, of, the, of the personalities and the character until I actually came into the place and they'd had 
a fair amount of success. They have asked diverse group in terms of personality backgrounds in what they've done in their lives, etc. cetera. Um, the most interesting bunch of blokes too, but they had a, a togetherness and, and the case before I purse, et cetera, would understand this, this was a unique group of people which I know is totally different from where I'd come from in terms of the culture of the organisation and it was a real education for me and probably for them because I came from a totally different background. I am so pleased that I got the bullet and so proud of what we were able to achieve during that particular time. It was uh, the best period of football and I've been lucky enough to be in footy since I was about 18 years of age. Best period in my life and I'm so thankful A for the club for giving me the opportunity and B for the players here who supported me during that period of time. I'm forever thankful for that opportunity. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank five greats of the Carlton Football Club, Phil Malin, Mike Fitzpatrick, David Parkin, Jimmy Buckley and Ken Sheldon.